Good morning, friends. Today is Tuesday, May the 28th, 2024. The time now is 7.11 a.m. So this video or program basically marks the first video or program for my South Africa uh, series. Basically, I'm talking about my South Africa playlist, whether we are talking about domestic South Africa or South Africa. In this case, South Africa by itself as a playlist will focus on South Africa's geopolitical position and South Africa's position in Africa or its relations or relationship with countries in Africa and around the world in terms of economics, business, entrepreneurship, uh, into governmental activities, and so on and so on. So it is very interesting that I am beginning my South Africa uh, series with uh, the election. So today is, uh, once again, it is Tuesday, May the 28th, 2024. And tomorrow, May the 29th, will be South Africa's uh, presidential election or South Africa's general election. So it is very uh, interesting. Uh, many around the world, and I know South Africans at home and abroad, are keeping close eyes to uh, the election or election result. Okay? Couple of things that I want to highlight. One being that uh, it is being projected or uh, basically predicted by many experts out there and individuals or institutions that the ANC, that is South Africa's African National Congress, will basically lose its uh, majority uh, grip or majority control of the South African uh, government. So the ANC, okay, on the figures such as Nelson Mandela, basically uh, was uh, the paragon, okay, the galvanizing force behind uh, South Africa's uh, or South African or black South African and others uh, solidarity movement that basically ended apartheid, at least uh, uh, visually, okay, visually, symbolically. But apartheid uh, as an economic practice, okay, apartheid as uh, Eurocentricity or white European uh, supremacy still does exist in Africa, okay? And it is the case in the world. It is the case in terms of how international relations is a practice. And we are seeing that uh, happening with the the court case against uh, uh, Israel, whether you support Israel or not, whether Israel is wrong or not, whether Israel is defending itself or not, the manner uh, by which uh, Europeans or European countries are making threats against the rest of the world or criticizing the rest of the world. In this case, the ANC okay, and the South African government, the manner in which or by which Western governments had uh, criticize South Africa, okay, or try to delegitimize South Africa. To an extent, I do believe, is uh, uh, a form of apartheid uh, uh, activities. So I use the word apartheid in terms of uh, the South African history and something that uh, an old man, a colleague of mine, and this man is in his 70s. He is uh, an African. He is a Nigerian. So we were talking uh, last Friday about geopolitics and a couple of things happening in Africa, in both Nigeria and Kenya. We were discussing about uh, Kenyan President William Ruto's uh, trip, okay? I talked to him about it, okay? He didn't know about it, so I brought it to his attention in that I've uh, made a video or a program. So we were discussing, and one thing he stressed, and I told him I'm going to steal it. He said to me, that we are in a world of apartheid. Basically, he uh, was saying that in this world we all live in, there is an apartheid system that we all live in, but we do not realize it. And this is the case 
we are seeing, for example, uh, Columbia University, uh, Harvard University, where a couple of uh, students uh, face uh, backlash because of their stance, okay, uh, on the situation going on in Israel or Palestine or however you want to term it. Uh, in Stanford universities and around the United States and around the world, where young students are being uh, reprimanded, being criticized, being canceled because of their position, okay, the positions that they are taking, uh, the protest against Israel or what's going on in Israel, Palestine, or however you want to term it. It shows in this world you dare not speak or you dare not say certain things, okay? Now, I did deviate significantly, but let me go back to uh, South Africa. The ANC had been agitating in uh, uh, recent times. Whether we are talking about the ANC's support for the Palestinian cause, or I do believe, like they say, the straw that breaks the camel's back. South African governments basically taking Israel to the ICJ, uh, to court, to the international court. I do believe with that, there could be a move out there by international elites in the West to oust the ANC because the ANC is the paragon in South African politics and it is challenging the West. The ANC refused to condemn Russia, okay? The ANC and the South African government refused to condemn Russia over the Ukrainian war and still uh, maintain strong relationship with Russia. And the ANC and the South African government basically took Israel to court, to the ICJ, over what's happening in Israel or in Gaza, if you will, however you want to term it. So with that, I do believe, in addition to many things that have happened in, in South Africa, whether we are talking about corruption uh, uh, and other activities, challenging the West and refusing to uh, take on the Western cause, over uh, the situation in uh, uh, Ukraine or taking Israel to the ICJ. I do believe for many elites in the West, it was a no-no. So in this case, I do believe there are moves out there, okay, to oust the ANC and basically weaken the ANC. However, if that happens, I do believe it is going to weaken South Africa as a country and I say government significantly. We have a situation, for example, where uh, even the quote unquote apartheid, uh, symbolically, viscerally, was uh, defeated to an extent because we can still see apartheid symbolically, visually in South Africa in terms of the uh, differences in standard of living and the differences in where people live in South African uh, cities and towns. I have never been to South Africa, but we are seeing pictures and videos and stories and talks out there about the reality of the situation in South Africa in terms of race relationships or relations and economic activities of the various groups in the country. But this then begs my uh, exploration of the whole idea of democracy, which is uh, defined as a system of government uh, established for the people, by the people, and of the people. A system of government in which or by which the people governs, okay? The people uh, dictate to the governors, okay? The, the country is governed based on the consent of the people. At least that is the theoretical or the... Uh, uh, the literal definition of democracy. However, the figurative definition of democracy, the practical aspect of it, it is totally different, at least to my knowledge or to my uh, observation or based on my knowledge and observation. Now, in terms of democracy, I do not despise democracy, but I am very cautious about democracy. I am very suspicious about democracy today in terms of the manner in which it is practiced. If you look at what's happening in the world, it appears that countries such as China, Russia, uh, uh, North Korea, and Iran are the four countries in the world whose government that the United States, Britain, France, Germany, and the rest of the West, and I'm talking about the white West, has not 
infiltrated, okay? So the West has not infiltrated these government, at least for the Chinese. It is going to be difficult, and I do believe that is the fear that the United States and the West has for China, okay? They have not and may not be able to infiltrate the Chinese government and subjugating it and making it, okay, rendering it dysfunctional from the inside. But uh, in terms of many countries or other countries around the world, the aspect of democracy that is practiced, which is all about the vote, okay, we get the big pageantry and people go and vote. In this case, it is beneficial to the West because as long as there is election, you always will see in the global south people electing idiots okay guys who come to power and do nothing for the people they are democratic but they build nothing they do nothing for the people and the people the people's lives do not change significantly for the better but we claim to be democratic when there is a quote unquote democracy the voting aspect of it, the symbolic aspect of it. It benefits the West because it can infiltrate a government or a country. It can support one uh, a group of a, uh, a country or within a country against the rest, rendering the system dysfunctional, creating conflict, which inevitably could lead to two things. The government becoming totally dysfunctional, corruption taking hold of the country, or the government and the country split completely, becoming two. And we are seeing that in many cases around the world. And I do believe no country with a totally distinctive group or grouping can stay together. No. Whenever the groups within a country become totally distinctive and hold on to their distinction and do not want to do or to deal with the other, the country will break apart. In the United States, after the revolution, the revolutionaries basically said, we don't want these pro-royalists uh, out of here. Get the hell out. Go to Canada. Okay? In every uh, 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 country out there, as much as there could be different political party, the policy is only that of oneness. We may have the Democrats and the Republicans, but their belief is America's uh, 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 dominance of the world, America's subjugation of the rest of the world. Anybody there to challenge the United States, they basically uh, uh, get dealt with swiftly. So with the situation in South Africa, and once again, I apologize for deviating, but I just wanted to paint a picture that you may be able to use to understand what I am uh, trying to convey here. But uh, in terms of the situation in South Africa, we could see, one, the harsh criticism of the ANC in South Africa could lead to people voting against the ANC significantly, or the West and its institutions and allies could basically rig the election in South Africa in the favor of the oppositions to depower, dethrone the ANC. So now, in terms of uh, the situation in uh, South Africa. Many are stressing that the ANC is in trouble, that the ANC of South Africa is going to be losing or could be losing its uh, uh, majority in the South African parliament or government, if you will. Okay? Uh, and they are stressing a couple of things, but two seems to stand out. One being the whole economic uh, situation in South Africa. And the economic situation in South Africa goes from uh, inequality, okay, whether we are talking about blacks, uh, inequality, or other uh, aspects of it, to the, the constant power cuts in South Africa. And then the other, which is uh, corruption, government and specifically ANC corruption. Now, I do have two uh, problems with that. One... The whole idea of corruption. Corruption is universal. Corruption is not African or South African. In every country, in every place, in every region, on every continent, in the world, corruption 
is going on in various forms or in various ways. Some countries, some people, some individuals, some institutions are corrupted morally. Okay? Not just in terms of uh, the ability or the willingness to uh, uh, cheat the people, but morally, there is aspect or there are aspects out there of moral uh, corruption. So South Africa is not the only corrupt country, and South African government is not the only uh, corrupt government in the world. Now, in terms of the corruption, yes, South African people should make their government and government official pay in the manner that they feel uh, uh, necessary, based on their intuition, based on their belief, okay, or belief system, not based on the, the influence or the agitations by others, by outsiders, okay, who basically despise the South African government or the ANC. I know in South Africa there is a guy who has been uh, making the news a lot and also on social media. Uh, it's a white man, a white guy from the United Kingdom who traveled to South Africa and became a citizen, okay, a naturalized citizen. And this guy is basically agitating for Western Cape to basically uh, split from South Africa and become its own country. It is a very sick uh, uh, activity or reality, and it is very interesting, but concerning. The fact that you come from Europe, you are granted citizenship by an African country, and you agitating the destruction of that country. Such activities could not work, will not work in China. Now, in terms of the economic aspect, we have a situation of the, uh, uh, the current power cuts. It is very interesting, though, that I wanted to ask myself many times, the fact that such uh, uh, reality gains uh, momentum in the West, is it because there are white South Africans, or white people in South Africa, and you have... Uh, those who live there and you have the international elites who have interest in South Africa? Or is it because of the reality that such countries should not be uh, out of power for some period of time in the day? Because the truth is, most of Africa experience power cuts. Whether we are talking about Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, Ghana, Ivory Coast, okay, Congo, Central African Republic, and you name it. So power cut is not unique to South Africa. But again, we have to be fair because to an extent, South Africans are very much used to, to having powers on most time uh, of the day compared to uh, other African countries. The standard of living in South Africa is much higher than other or most African countries. So we have to be fair. But now, in terms of the economic aspect, whether we are talking about black empowerment or lack of jobs and other uh, 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 realities out there, we have to be honest with the fact that South Africa, quote unquote, the democracy that is South Africa right now, which in itself, it is still an apartheid form of democracy because the means of production is still heavily owned by uh, white South Africans and black people. Yes, we've had situations where many, okay, or a handful of black people have become successful since apartheid. But the majority of South Africans still live in shanty towns or still under the economic radar. Okay, they are still struggling for their day-to-day -day, uh, uh, living. So, now... That is something that I want to stress. Perhaps I may be wrong. Perhaps I may be missing some pointers. But I hope uh, you can share your opinion uh, with me. Okay. Once again, in terms of the economy, when apartheid, quote unquote, symbolically, uh, visually, was defeated to an extent, many things did not happen. One was the distribution of land did not happen to the point where today many in South Africa, whether we are talking about Julius Malema and others, 
And I do believe, if I can remember, Tamar and Becky also uh, wanted to carry out such policy to distribute land. And we saw many white South Africans and farmers went ballistic. They started criticizing the government of South Africa and accusing it of uh, racist, uh, being racist against whites. And even in the United States, the white South African uh, friends or allies in the United States basically went ballistic, criticizing the South African government to the point where uh, even Donald Trump was criticizing the South African government. So when it comes to distributing land, they oppose it. When it comes to, or when it came to uh, basically distributing the economic uh, opportunities, okay, to socialize or to make public the means of production, whites in South Africa, or many whites in South Africa basically refused, and they criticized that. And in fact, after apartheid, when apartheid was, quote unquote, and once again, symbolically, visually defeated to an extent, there were those South Africans who left the country with the perspective or the belief that black South Africans or the black South African government will basically pay back. Many now are in countries around the world and others are returning. What they've anticipated or predicted never happened, never came to fruition. So, but if I should talk about that era, I do believe it does bear uh, uh, justice to even bring in, to bring in figures such as Nelson Mandela. I do believe what Nelson Mandela and those who came into the government at the time did. The fact that they did not go after uh, property to basically distribute wealth and the, uh, the economy. Part of it is they know what they faced. White South African backlash and also the power, the international power elites that basically owns the uh, means of production in South Africa were in no way going to distribute the wealth or allow their property, their earning, whether they took it illegally, whether they stole it from the Africans or not, to be distributed among the people, especially blacks. So that is something that we need to take into consideration. But I also do believe what Nelson Mandela and them did by not trying to uh, distribute land and everything at the time, other than the fact that they knew what they faced, I do believe, knowing what they faced, they decided let's at least focus on just freeing our people. Let the people rest, let them come. And these uh, policies will be carried out by succeeding generations. Because as of now, we cannot break uh, the system. Okay, we cannot break the glass. We cannot uh, uh, successfully carry out policies that breaks uh, the camel's back because the international elites of the West who owns the means of production will go ballistic against us. So I do believe that to an extent was a perception, was a belief uh, within the ANC. But once again, the international elite owning South African economy, but if you Take into consideration what's happening. The, uh, uh, the population size of South Africa from 93, 94 is much larger. So given all this, uh, uh, we must consider the fact that South African population growth, in addition to population growth due to migration into the country from Zimbabwe and other Southern African countries, it also leads to uh, an exhaustion of the system, the economic system, for uh, uh, the immigrants and also the South Africans alike. So with this being the case, we should not fail to acknowledge the fact that part of the situation going on in South Africa in terms of its uh, economy is due to the fact that uh, it has to run an economy where the population has grown exponentially or significantly, if you will. 
The system in the world, financially and economically, has changed. All over the world, countries have uh, experienced uh, uh, inflation or hyperinflation to a diverse extent. Okay? So South Africa face, or faces a situation that is not unique to the country, that is universal. So we have to be fair, okay, in the criticism of South Africa as a country and the ANC as a ruling party or as a government. So, once again, we have to acknowledge all this, uh, uh, all this, or all these realities. But uh, the ANC, being the paragon, the center of South African politics, I do believe the ANC should uh, maintain uh, 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 dominance as of now, must maintain uh, basically its majority. That's the word that I mean, the phrase. It must maintain the uh, uh, majority because the ANC does mean, at least for now, to, to a greater extent, stability in South Africa and oneness in South Africa, solidarity. You breaking up the ANC and you giving the other parties too much power where they are infiltrated, the situation of corruption is not going to go away. Perhaps it could be worse. And in this case, South Africa would be susceptible to more international pressure and more international infiltration by the powerful elites, countries, institutions, and individuals out there. So I want to make this clear. Despite the trouble or troubles that the ANC finds itself in uh, as of now, despite all the criticism, despite the, uh, the growing power or the growing prestige or the growing strength of the opposition parties, I do believe the South African people, the voters, okay, do remember what the ANC was, especially to black people. Uh, South African people and people of color in South Africa, as well as, or as much as what uh, the ANC is and the situation that the ANC has found itself in a world as my Nigerian uh, colleagues, okay, an old man in his 70s said to me that we are in a world of apartheid. Whether we are talking about social apartheid, economic apartheid, okay, we are in a world where the elites have told many of us, for example, Africans, we are told that we do not have history and we should not dare think about history, think about a certain ourselves or ourselves in the world. We do not have history and that what we are good for in the world is to basically, as Africa or Africans, to provide the rest of the world, the elites, our countries and institutions, raw materials, for the abetterment and that we should suffer, okay, we should starve. We should not dare uh, impose ourselves. We should not have perspective on global matters, even on matters pertaining to our livelihood, our Africa, okay? We are in a world of uh, political, social, economic, financial uh, apartheid, cultural apartheid, and we can see that in various forms around the world as my Nigerian uh, colleague uh, stress. But in terms of South Africa and the ANC, the criticism of South African government and the ANC, I do believe to an extent, is out of place. This country or this quote-unquote democracy that, that many continue to talk about is only three decades, 30 years old. And this is... One of the reasons I have problem with some of the things that come uh, that comes out of the West, where Africans and others around the world in the global South are harshly criticized and basically trying to force upon a Western style system that the West has uh, developed for 500 uh, years, five centuries, to countries that are just few decades old. It is impossible, nonsensical, and, and just outlandish. Okay? So I think it is unfair. South Africa is 30 years old. Okay? The new South Africa, the current South Africa, is 30 years old. In just six years, apartheid, 
could have slipped into the uh, 21st century. So I think the criticism of uh, the South African government and the ANC is unfair. But I do believe that the doom that is being spelled for the uh, ANC, I do believe, will not come to fruition to an extent. I do believe the doom and gloom that is being uh, predicted is not going to be likely. Now, uh, a couple of things. I looked at one article that basically, okay, uh, it just caught my attention. This is a CNN article or headline, and the title once again reads, South Africa has failed its black majority. Nelson Mandela's political heirs may pay the price. So it is very interesting. When I read uh, this article, I was looking for how South Africa failed its blacks' uh, majority. The article did not stress, okay, to, to my knowledge, I believe, when I looked at it, did not stress the economic uh, disparity in the country in terms of it did not stress what the ANC inherited from the apartheid regime, which is a poor uh, majority population, which were never integrated into the South African economics or economy, uh, finance, and social system for how many hundred years? Okay, uh, the it did not uh, uh, the article did not stress that or stress. Uh, the fact that the South African economy, okay, the means of production is owned by white South Africans and outsiders who are reluctant to, uh, to grant uh, the black majority position within uh, the system. So a couple of things that I highlighted and I'm going to go over. So I'm going to read. Once again, the article's title reads, South Africa has failed its blacks majority. Nelson Mandela's political heirs may pay the price. Continue. Fast forward 30 years and Nelson Mandela's erstwhile liberation movement, while triumphed over the racist apartheid government, risked losing its parliamentary majority for the first time, according to opinion polls and analysis. When South Africans vote Wednesday, that's tomorrow, an unhappy combination of rampant corruption, sowing joblessness, crippling power cuts, and feeble economic growth will likely be top of mind. The economy has gone backward over the past decades, evidenced by a sharp fall in living standard. According to the World Bank, gross domestic product per capita has fallen from a peak in 2011 leaving the average South Africans 23% poor. I must stress the population of South Africa has grown, I think double. South Africa now should have about 58 to 60 million people. The last time I checked, I'm going to continue. A third of the labor force is unemployed, more than in war-torn Sudan and the highest rate of any country tracked by the World Bank. A third of the country is unemployed, of the labor force, more than Sudan. I don't know how that possible, but I'm going to continue. There are 18.4 million people on welfare benefits, compared with just 7 million taxpayers, according to Oxford Economics, a consultancy. Now, in terms of the tax uh, situation, it is the same in African countries as well. We need to do better in terms of taxing our people. I'm going to continue. Black South Africans who make up 81% of the population are at the sharp end of this dire situation. Unemployment and poverty remains concentrated in the black majority, in large part due to the failure of public schooling, while most white South Africans have jobs and command considerably higher wages. Now, my problem with that statement, is this the result of failure of public schooling or the fact that apartheid left South Africa a very poor and uneducated population, which the ANC has to service 
for 30 years. If we look at what's happening in South Africa, yes, the ANC is slow, but the ANC has made significant uh, 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 improvement. Africans, people around the world, in the global south, following uh, uh, decolonization, the vast majority of people in the global south were uneducated. If you look at the global south, the people are becoming much educated than uh, during the days prior to uh, decolonization. So I don't know whether it is public schooling alone currently or the fact that apartheid basically left uh, the ANC, a very terrible situation. But I'll continue. Moreover, the government's flagship policy for driving economic inclusion and racial equality in post-apartheid South Africa, board-based black economic empowerment, known as Triple B or simply BEEB, -E has failed to achieve its aims with wealth still concentrated in the hands of a few at the expense of the many. So the few, who makes up the few? Be specific. I'm going to continue. Elite enrichment. Under apartheid and colonial rule before that, black South Africans were violently oppressed and denied many basic rights. They were also systematically excluded from owning land, living in certain areas, and accessing a decent education and jobs. The end of white minority rule could not on its own compensate for such extreme and prolonged injustice. Restitution was needed, and that's what BEE set out to deliver. There is now almost universal agreement that the policy failed to transform economic reality for the majority of black and other South Africans who were historically disadvantaged, including Indians and colored. The official terms for South Africans with mixed heritage who have a distinct cultural identity. President Cyril Ramaphosa, who has previously described BEE as a must for economic growth, promised Saturday the ANC would do better if re-elected with a focus on creating more jobs. Really, you have to be re-elected to do better? You should have or could have done better the first time. I'm going to continue. The Democratic Alliance, the official opposition party, has said it would replace BEE with an economic justice policy that targets the poor black majority for redress rather than a small connected elite. I'm going to continue. Black people are also poorly represented in top management, another of the policy's focus areas. According to a recent PwC report, just 19% of the 200 most valuable companies listed in Johannesburg are led by black, color, Indian, or Asian CEOs. Many companies in the private sectors are not implementing the spirit of the BEE legislation. They are only ticking box, said Kangi Matabani, the CEO of the Black Business Council, a lobby group for black business. Businesses cannot continue to exclude the majority They'll render the country ungovernable one day, he added. So that is a very strong point, and I like that point. Once again, that is a very strong point, and I like that point. And this is what uh, the apartheid uh, regime did, or government did, if you will. And I do believe that is one of the reasons for the situation that South Africa is. You have a racial policy towards people because of their color or because of their, their heritage, their history. And it turns out these people make up the majority of your population. Today we have 81% of South Africa being black people. If you add uh, the color, okay, 
that's a, a, a very significant number. If you add the Indian, white South Africans basically make, make up about 6 to 8% of the population. So even if we do not add Indian and color to the mix, just the black population alone, 81% of your people are poor or they are basically uh, underrepresented in the economy or in finance. It is bad for a country. So I think as much as it makes sense to criticize the ANC for what uh, the situation of South Africa is, it is also important and serves justice that we also point to the fact that what the ANC uh, basically has had for the past three decades is a very poor, very underrepresented, uh, okay, and uh, undereducated black masses. While at the same time, the white South African elites or the uh, international elites who basically own the means of production in South Africa are reluctant to uh, enable the country or to allow the government, the country, to create a system, okay, a policy that brings in the black majority into the economy and into finance. That is something that I want to stress. Now, I am not an expert. I am just a man with an opinion, a man with a perspective and a man who dared to engage in various topics relating to uh, geopolitics. Of course, my perspective is based on the African perspective or how we Africans and people in the African diaspora, basically how we uh, see ourselves, how we define ourselves in geopolitics or in terms of our position in the world. Now, I am going to end here. But please, tell me what you think. Tell me what I said wrong. Tell me what I am missing. Tell me what possible uh, things I did not get right or that was flawed about uh, my program. And tell me, give me advice on what I could do to grow, what I could do to become better in terms of what I am doing now, in terms of uh, the echoing voice, engaging in discussion of geopolitics or discussions in topics or discussion of topics of various sort. But most importantly, share this video, share the links with your friends and families, with others. And thank you very much for watching The Echoing Voice. Peace.